<laughs> Do- President Donald Trump mentioned red flag laws as a possibility, okay? So I want to talk about this because then you, you've been catching flack from the left and you've also caught some um, some guff, I guess we could say, from from the right. Uh, he said that uh, we must make measures, uh, make sure that those judged to pose a grave risk to public safety do not have access to firearms. And if they do, those firearms can be taken through rapid uh, due process. And you mentioned the TAPS Act, um, maybe also implement state red flag laws or gun violence restraining orders. So a lot of people obviously not thrilled about this idea, a lot of uh, conservatives. And to be fair, you were more open-minded and said, maybe there is a solution here, maybe there isn't. Can you explain specifically uh, to people what it is that you you think you'll be proposing so that they yeah. don't misinterpret it? We already have, but, uh, but and I appreciate the nuance you added to that, which is I said, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe we look at these at the state level. Right. On the TAPS Act, which I am in favor of, uh, I'm a co-sponsor. The the TAPS Act is has gotten. There's been a lot of misinformation out about it, and it's it's. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but here here's what it actually is. It is a grant program that allows local law enforcement to use the same tools and analytical analytical tools and training on behavioral threat assessments that federal law enforcement has been using for 35 years. Okay. This doesn't change the law in any way. It doesn't change their ability to implement the law. It doesn't change who they target. It just it just gives local law enforcement some of the same tools that say the Capitol Police have, or other federal law enforcement agencies has. Uh, so can I ask you a, qu- a quick question? Can I ask you a question? A quick question sure. then, because this is important for me. Is this kind of congruent with the laws already on the books? So, for example, we have strict background checks, felons, uh, violent criminals. They can't legally obtain firearms or those who've been declared mentally defective in a court of law. So do these, the, does the TAPS Act or what people are calling red flag laws add to that at all? Or does it just reinforce what we already have kind of on the books? It would reinforce it. And I would say there's almost no relationship whatsoever between the TAPS Act and red flag laws. Okay. Two very different things. Uh, when, it, when it comes to the TAPS Act, it, it really has nothing to do with guns. Uh, this is just criminal behavior in, in general. Now, obviously, it could prevent people from engaging in mass shootings for sure, but the TAPS Act has nothing to do with gun control at all. Okay. Uh, on the red flag laws, you, you did you ask an important question, and you're, what you're pointing out in the process of asking that question is the fact that under current federal law, there's already a lot of reasons why you might not be able to own a gun. Right. Okay. A lot more than people maybe even realize. Uh, you engage in threatening behavior under some kind of restraining order. Uh, you've engaged in domestic abuse. You're a felon. You've been discharged dishonorably from the military. Things like this prevent you from owning a weapon. Red flag laws are really designed to fill in the information gap, right? Because that prevents you from buying a weapon. But what prevents you from actually having it when you are engaging in threatening behavior and therefore infringing on the rights of others? I mean, this is this is an important basic foundation of why government exists and why laws exist. Right. It's to prevent citizens from infringing on the life, liberty, and property of other citizens. We monopolize the use of force as a government in order to prevent injustices done against each other and also to protect rights. But those rights get taken away when you start infringing on other people's rights. So right. It's a very just basic conservative philosophy. When we talk about red flag laws, and, and, and you're probably going to get to this question, but maybe I'll just go ahead and answer it, which sure. is, how do we make sure they're done right if we're going to even talk about these things? And that's a legitimate concern, right? There's a due process concerns. There's people's concerns that can your neighbor just call in a, a, a something, call the police against you, and then you have your, your guns taken away? Well, we wouldn't want any of that, and, and we, we should have those concerns. And I think there's certain stringent safeguards that need to be put in place to ensure that due process uh, would be adhered to, such as uh, multiple points of evidence. Okay, not it can't just be one person's testimony. There has to be actual evidence presented. It has to be clear and convincing, uh, not not even just a preponderance of evidence, but I think clear and convincing evidence. Uh, the, the, any there should be a punishment for somebody who files a false claim against someone else to deter that kind of, uh, you know, sort of vindictive behavior. That, that, that was be going to be about. one of my questions. Uh, it seems to me that would be a necessity. Uh, otherwise, you end up with sort of the, the frivolous medical lawsuits, right, where someone can just chase an ambulance and sue and sue and sue without any recourse. Only in this case, you're stripping someone of their God-given right, right to, to self-defense. So that would be something that you think would be right. necessary in there as a safeguard, a penalty for falsely reporting. I, I think so. I think conservatives need to have a list of, of requirements, and, and that list is out there, by the way. We've had hearings about this. Uh, scholars from the Cato Institute, Libertarian Think Tank, have pretty much outlined what we would need to see in mm-hmm. order to make this uh, plausible. 
another thing I would add is who has standing to actually make the accusation? Some state laws limit it to family members, uh, household members, police, doctors. Uh, I, I think Cato suggests that we actually only limit it to police. So that only police can look at the evidence and say we have standing to there now take it to a court and have a judge rule on this based on the evidence given uh, and, and based on the ability and based on due process. You need to be able to argue your case back as well and have an attorney present. So, well, I guess we kind of for me and forgive me. I'm not, really, I'm not. I don't mean to be simple, but that does come back to my question: is and what's what's wrong with the due process that we have now? You know, a judge right now can you know adjudicate yeah. you mentally defective. Why not stick with that and just make sure that you know the crime reports are being submitted? Because we have some laws in the books. You know, this I, I don't remember if it was Parkland. It's tough to keep track of the shootings, but some local law enforcement just didn't submit the reports that they were supposed to. You know, you had a kid who had who had beaten his mom, who had taken firearms that weren't his. But why? I guess my question is, well, how does this process that you're describing differ from what we have now, innocent until proven guilty and proven in a court of law? And why is that a good thing? Because for the same reason, we don't want only cops to have guns. We don't want only cops to determine right, who can right. have guns. Yeah, th that is a good question. It fills an information gap. So right now there are there are, there are laws in place. And, and I think in Parkland, they, they could have arrested him for his threatening behavior. Um, maybe taken his weapons that was an extreme case though there were so many red flags that right. you didn't even need a red flag law red flag laws kind of operate in, in between right where you don't want to necessarily arrest somebody and, and actually take away their entire liberty uh but they are exhibiting threatening behavior and in addition they're, they're they're filling an information gap in order to enforce the laws that you know you already can the, the, that process is not very clearly in place right now and I, and, I, and i think that would be that would be where these laws actually come into play, if that makes sense. Well, a little bit. I think that it would need to be crystal clear for conservatives, including myself. I want to be fair here. You know, I don't I don't want you to think that I go out there public and say, like, ah, I'm against red flag laws and just be friendly because I, I enjoy your company. But for me, it would have to be crystal clear because, yeah, I am pretty leery about this, obviously, in the same way that, you know, listen, on, yeah. on Twitter, we can have people who dox me, right? On YouTube, we can have people who go out there and threaten my family. And it's not a violation, but someone deems it a violation if we criticize a public figure. You know, it's not enforced equally, and that can happen anytime there's a margin for human error, whether it's a, a judge or a police officer. I guess to put a fine, finer point out, let me kind of present a hypothetical, and maybe this might might help as a thought exercise. Let's say like an, an angry wife wants to hurt her husband or her ex-husband. Uh, he owns many guns, AR-15s, pistols, shotguns, like my recurve bow, African throwing knives, all of it. Not as efficient as me, but he has all of it. And she knows that he owns many firearms. So uh, she creates a story about him being abusive, uh, not necessarily with evidence. He hasn't been convicted of domestic abuse, but she does get a restraining order. People need to understand that you don't need to be necessarily convicted of a serious crime for a restraining order to be issued. Uh, then tell, she'll tell her the authorities that her ex-husband is unstable, abusive about how many guns he has. He's a danger to those around him. What's the process like? And let's say there's a gun confiscation that's, that's ordered. It turns out he's innocent. Is it reversed? Because then you end up with the kind of guilty until proven innocent. I mean, this is something that definitely is, is tough for me to process. Yeah, first I would say any any new law and process that, that gets implemented still operates within the context of our criminal justice system, which adheres to the philosophy of innocent until proven guilty. That would never change. The due process aspect of these things would not change. Um, even, even though there's a lot of concern that they would, I see no evidence of that and, uh, and no evidence that that would change it. Um, you know, in, in that specific scenario, it, it, it's hard to tell. I think I just agree with your point, though, that the preponderance of evidence would have to be very, very crystal clear. It should not you should not allow this to happen based on the testimony of one person. And especially if that one person is not providing any actual evidence uh, that as conservatives, when we when we have this conversation. And by the way, we need to have the conversation. What, I, what I'm seeing online sure. a lot is a lot of people refusing to have the conversation. And, and, and reacting to what are basically straw man arguments. Right. We have to have the conversation. And, uh, and, and if we're going to, though, we, we, we put thoughtful limits in place on what we would actually agree to. And, and a very substantive 
standard of evidence would certainly be one of those. And the scenario you're describing, I would never agree to. Right. You know? be because we've had a lot of people on the left say, well, this person is on the no fly list. I mean, I'm sure you know many. I know many people who've been put yes. on the no fly list because they exactly. have the same name <laughs> exactly. as people who are on the no fly list. And people act as though I'm crazy. We talked exactly. about the conversation. I said, well, hold on. It's not a terrorist watch list. It's an arbitrary list, you know. And so I would hate to see this morph right. into that. I think that's a legitimate concern. But I do think that it's we are at a point where we can discuss what within the parameters of the Constitution, the current rule of law we have, would be more effective. Um, and there are some options out there. It, I, I just think, and maybe you can you can help with this. There aren't many people out there who have a direct line of communication with their constituency um, as you do. I think it would go a long way to explain it, you know, to the letter, so that people at least know what what they're supporting or what they're against. Yeah, and we're putting that together. And I would encourage everybody to look at Senator Graham's bill, Senator Rubio's bill and uh some of the some of the safeguards that they w w would ask to be put in place it, in the end I, i'm i'm not i'm not advocating for federal implementation of this either right. uh one of the reasons it needs to be done at the state level also is is because that's where criminal law is written mm -hmm. and so it's it's not clear that you could even write it perfectly at the federal level because all states uh implement um you know be, these laws differently whether they're whether they're gun laws or, or whether they're mental health laws or whether they're domestic abuse or restraining order laws, a lot of these might have to be tailored at the local level.